Good morning. It's wonderful to be back in the saddle after a three weeks break of recording services. I trust that the three weeks of services from the different congregations of our Nelksa Church have been a blessing to you as much as it's been to me. So we are back in the fourth week of July, the seventh Sunday after Trinity, and the watchword for this week is taken from Ephesians 2 verse 9. For you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. What a wonderful reminder that we are still one in Christ and that we are part of one big family that is a family of believers, a family that supports each other, a family that is there to strengthen one another and to really give expression to the love of God that is shared amongst us. So as we celebrate the service together, we do so as the family of God, knowing that God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is with us as we celebrate. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are members of your household that you love us and that that love also finds expression in the way that we treat each other. Thank you that you call us to be brothers and sisters in you. And thank you that we are together growing to be your family. Amen. Let us join together in prayer with the words from Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story, those he redeemed from the hands of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from the east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in the desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things.
The epistle reading is taken from Acts chapter 2, the verses 41 to 47. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They, they devoted themselves to the apostles' reading and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your love for me. I'm forever grateful that you sacrificed your Son. You saved my soul and changed my destiny. Thank you, God, for Jesus in me. I'm so glad that Jesus lives in my house. Good to know that he is here with me now. All of my life, Jesus in me, Jesus in my house. All of my life and always will be. Thank you for the purpose you have placed in me. Thank you for forgiveness and the chance to start again. I face the future knowing I will be safe and sound with Jesus in me. I'm so glad that Jesus lives in my house. Good to know that He is here with me now. All of my life, Jesus in me, Jesus in my house. All of my life and always will be. I'm so glad that Jesus lives in my house. Good to know that He is here with me now. All of my life, Jesus in me. Jesus in my house, all of my life, and always will be. The Gospel reading is taken from John chapter 6, the verses 1 to 15. Jesus fed the 5,000. Some time after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed. By healing the sick. Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for the, these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered, it would take more than half a year wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how, how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About five thousand men were there. Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. And now, together with all Christians on earth, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. One thing I love about the letters of the New Testament is this. The one moment they speak in big words about the profound big things of our faith. And the lofty words quite literally pick us up where we are on earth and for a moment transport us into a different place where we can see a glimpse of who God is in all his glory. And the next moment, it brings us straight back to earth, but in a good way. The letters often teach the big things of the faith that the readers need to hear and then take them to their own life situation and then ask the question, now, what does this have to do with you and your brothers and sisters in the faith in your life situation? And then it often gets really practical. The letter to the Hebrews is one of these letters that does exactly that. One moment it paints a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ, our great high priest, who does atonement for our sins before our Father in heaven. And then, all of a sudden, it gives some very practical instructions before going back to these amazing, beautiful truths and pictures about what God is doing for us in heaven. So let's get practical then. I read to you from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1 to 3. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to entertain strangers. 
for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are ill-treated as if you yourselves were suffering. Let us look at this practical advice bit by bit. Let's remember that this was written to a very specific group of believers in a very specific situation. And if we want to understand what it means for us, we need to first understand what it meant for them and then translate it into our own situation. So let us start with the first bit. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Now, it might sound obvious. If God is love and Jesus is the expression of God's love to us, we are told to share this love. Well then, where do we start? With our own brothers and sisters in the faith, of course. Sounds simple, doesn't it? But so often it gets neglected. Not only in the book of Hebrews do we read about this. We also read in the first letter of John, if someone says, I love God, but hates his brother, then he is a liar. Also here we see that faith must be lived out in our practical everyday lives. The letter of John goes on. How can you claim to love God whom you don't see if you hate your brother who you do see? Even in the early church, there were different groups who disagreed about some pretty serious matters. In the book of Hebrews particularly, which was written mainly to Jewish Christians spread around the Greek and Roman world, we can actually imagine quite a few reasons why this was emphasized so much. When confronted with Roman or Greek Christians who did things differently, the Jewish believers are reminded to continue to love their Greek and Roman brothers and sisters even as they might disagree with them about certain things. Of course, the same must be said to the Greek and the Roman Christians too. But this particular letter was directed to the Jewish Christians. Why was it so important to emphasize this to them? The reality was the Jewish people that were spread out all along the well-known cities of the Roman and the Greek world, they felt threatened by the Roman and the Greek majority in the cities that they moved to. So it was natural for them to retreat to a place where they felt culturally comfortable. A place where the people thought the same as them, spoke the same as them and did the same as them. The result was that some of the Jewish believers ended up rejecting Jesus again as their saviour because they felt they couldn't do without the cultural reassurance of their fellow Jews. The believers must be reminded, what connects you with your brothers and sisters is that you are part of God's family. And in God's family we must love each other in spite of our differences. And as far as possible we must make space for these differences in the family. So long as these differences, of course, don't stand in opposition to God's purposes. In our situation, we also have many differences. Our cultural differences may also sometimes keep us apart. And we constantly need to work to make sure that we don't have a situation where one culture dominates the other or where one culture feels they don't have space. Or that certain viewpoints are crowded out in the church because that makes it difficult to live together as a family of believers. Otherwise, people will withdraw into their own cultures when they get the feeling that there's no space for them or when they are uncomfortable. And it takes great strength of character and humility to speak out about these matters. But it must happen to ensure that we remain one family in Christ. That is one important area where the gospel calls us to do the hard work of loving each other so that we may overcome our differences. 
And yes, we may very well be further down that road than some others, but there is always work to be done in this area. Then we come to another area where we are called to love our brothers and sisters in Christ during this difficult time we find ourselves in. That is the different opinions in our family of believers about how to respond appropriately to the COVID-19 crisis. Many are really scared about the virus and the danger it poses to those infected by it. And rightfully so. It is a really dangerous sickness and even more dangerous when there are not enough hospital beds left to treat those that become sick. Many are really scared about the damage to the economy that the virus and the precautions that have been put in place to fight the virus are causing. Or just simply, they're scared whether they will even have a job next month. And again, rightly so. The statistics show that many people have lost their jobs or are in some other way worse off financially than before. Others are concerned about the isolation and loneliness of, the people, of some people during lockdown. And they are also right. So let us try to understand the situation of our brothers and sisters that they find themselves in and respect them even if they might weigh the various risks and damages differently to the way that we do. In all of this, it is Jesus who will help us through whatever loss or suffering that we go through during this time. And we are called to love each other just as Jesus has loved us despite our differences in opinion. And we continue, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Do not forget to show hospitality. Now, during normal times, that would mean inviting our brothers and sisters in Christ into our own home. And when the pandemic is over, we need to get back to that as soon as we safely can. But God has also given us good sense that this form of hospitality might be inappropriate right now. But that doesn't mean that hospitality must stop. Sharing from the abundance of what we have, even without inviting or visiting, is also a form of hospitality. Checking up on those who might be struggling is also a form of hospitality. Bringing someone a meal when they are sick or in quarantine is also a form of hospitality. Now what does it mean when the letter says some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it? The original readers who would know the Old Testament quite well will immediately think of Abraham and Lot, who both literally entertained angels without knowing it. And of course, if God did that then, he can do it again. Nothing is impossible for God. But I can imagine that this is true in another way also. A few years ago, when I was still in Johannesburg, we once did a youth outreach week where we exposed a whole group of youth to different social outreach ministries. So we visited the homeless, we visited orphan children in a children's home, we visited uh, people living in a home uh, that was suffering from epilepsy, and quite a few other visits to different social outreach ministries. And there was one girl in this group who shared with us at the end, when we were sitting down at the end of the week to share what our experiences were, and she said to us, I've experienced more about God in this one week than in a whole year of sermons. The homeless, the people suffering from epilepsy, and the orphaned children 
quite literally became angels, messengers from God to this girl. When we start genuinely serving someone in need, we realize quickly that what we thought was a one-way street, me helping someone else, quickly becomes a two-way street. I grow and experience God and the world in a new and meaningful way through the encounter. And then we get a deeper understanding of what Jesus means when he says in Matthew 25 verse 45, whatever you have done for the least of these, you have done for me. Now to the third verse. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Now in the time of the early church, this quite literally meant prison as Christians were persecuted for their faith. And this still happens with Christians in some other countries to this day. Now if you happen to know any persecuted Christians, by all means, take this verse at face value. Remember them. Pray for them. And do this in whatever way you can. But I suspect that most of us don't personally know Christians who are in prison for their faith. But indirectly, there are Christians in this country who are also persecuted for their actions which come from their faith. Think of the whistleblowers, for example, who are ostracized for under uncovering corruption. Many of them who are Christians do so because their Christian ethics will not allow them to keep silent in the face of corruption and nepotism. And many of them are subjected to smear campaigns that in the end they quite literally suffer for the truth. Or think about those who tirelessly serve in the medical or nursing field at great danger to themselves during these COVID-19 times. And many of them are keeping themselves separate from their own families for their family safety and for their patient safety. And when they themselves develop symptoms and have to self-isolate for the sickness that they most likely have gotten from the very people that they are serving, they are also in a kind of prison, one can say, in order to serve the people that are sick. So let us remember those people in their prisons. And let us, of course, also remember those that are right now fighting for their lives in hospital, bound to their hospital bed in some field hospital somewhere or in some ICU somewhere. Let us also remember them in their prison. So here we have some very practical advice for us that we can live our Christian life by. Maybe not totally identical to the way that the original readers of Hebrew would have understood it, but certainly based on the same principles and the same spirit. So let us do what we can to keep loving our brothers and sisters. Our faith is a gift of God, but it must be lived in our everyday lives. Amen.
The peace of the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you celebrated the first communion with your disciples at the evening of the darkest hour of humankind. You gave yourself to the disciples in bread and wine to carry them through this darkest hour. The whole world is facing a crisis that we have not seen before. Therefore, we come to you because we need you to carry us through. You know the road that lies ahead. We don't. We gather here at your table to receive comfort, courage, strength and joy. Here, in your presence, we hear your voice. Fear not. We give thanks to you, God our Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He took upon himself all our sin, all our wrongdoings, so that we, being dead to sin, should live to righteousness. Therefore, with angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven, and all the church on earth, we adore and magnify your glorious name, and evermore praising you, we say, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat of this. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the meal and he gave thanks and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink of this. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So I invite you now all to share the bread and the wine. And you pass it from one person to the next with the words, The body of Christ given for you for the bread and the blood of Christ shed for you when you pass the wine. And may this strengthen and preserve us all in faith to everlasting life. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you now to bring to you everything that is on our minds. We pray for our members. Help us to find creative ways to show love in this difficult time. Help us to keep the bonds of brotherly and sisterly love strong, even though we cannot meet at this time. We pray for those who are infected with COVID-19. Be with them and heal them so that they can recover fully. We pray especially also for the hospitals as they fill up. Help the hospital staff to find ways to accommodate everyone and that everyone can receive the necessary treatment that they need. We pray for those who have lost their work or are suffering financially due to the situation we find ourselves in. We pray for those who are fighting loneliness and isolation. Comfort them and put people alongside them that they can lean on. We pray for those who are afraid of catching the virus, those who are in especially high-risk groups with probable comorbidities. We pray for those who are frontline health workers that are at high risk of being exposed to the virus. And we pray for those who cannot afford to be sick right now, where sickness might cause 
other knock-on effects that they will suffer from for a long time. Protect them, all of these people that we have lifted up to you now. We pray for those who struggle to put food on the table. Provide for them and help them to find the necessary food to care for their families. Be with all of us as we navigate this pandemic and everything that goes along with it. And above all, help us to love not only our brothers and sisters in the faith, but everyone around us. And we continue praying with the words that you have taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now go in the peace of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.